Welcome to Good Book. Um, I'm Mark Strauss, and this is our fourth session in a two-volume set of sessions covering the whole Bible, nine weeks on the Old Testament and nine weeks on the New Testament. Uh, we've called this uh, whole series His Story, or History. It's His Story in that it's God's story, God's purpose and plan of salvation from beginning to end. People were asking, we want to see the whole story of the Bible as it fits together, the meta-narrative of Scripture, so we can see the grand, the grand picture. So we're doing nine weeks on the Old Testament and nine weeks on the New Testament. As I said, this is week four in our nine weeks on the Old Testament. Um, let's just review, because we're doing this grand overview, we want to, every week we want to review and bring you up to where you, we are, um, bring you up to speed. Uh, let's start Briefly, in Genesis, the very first book of the, of the Old Testament, after the creation account, after humanity's fall into sin, we see God's plan of salvation launched with the patriarchs. Abraham is promised that through his descendants, all nations on the earth will be blessed. Abraham has a son miraculously in his old age named Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Through Jacob come the 12 tribes of Israel. When famine breaks out in the land, God has prepared the way to, to preserve Jacob's children, Jacob's family, by having Joseph in Egypt. And so all of Israel moves to Egypt to be saved from the famine, Joseph and his brothers. But then arises in Egypt a Pharaoh who doesn't, know, a Pharaoh who doesn't remember Joseph, and he enslaves the Israelites. And for 400 years, Israel is enslaved in Egypt until God raises up a deliverer in the book of Exodus that delivers name is, of course, Moses. And Moses leads God's people out of Egypt into salvation, takes them to Mount Sinai where God makes a covenant with them and gives them the law. So God's people prepare to enter the promised land, the, the land that God is going to give them as an inheritance. But then after they send the spies into the land, the people grumble and complain. They're afraid to enter the land. And so God judges that generation. He sends them back into the wilderness, where for 40 years they wander in the wilderness until that entire generation dies out. Um, this week, then, we come to the time when they're going to once again enter into the promised land. We call it Joshua and the conquest of Canaan, also the period of the judges. Uh, Moses had sinned against God at one point instead of speaking to the rock that, that brought water forth for the people to drink. He had struck the rock in anger. And because of that and other things, also because of his extreme age, he was 120 years old at this point, God told him he would not be able to enter the promised land. And Joshua then succeeds him as leader over Israel. After leading Israel for 40 years, God takes Moses up to Mount Nebo, and from Mount Nebo, he gives him a view of the entire promised land. And then Moses dies on Mount Nebo and passes the torch to Joshua, his successor. The theme of the Joshua narrative could be called, Be Strong and Courageous. As God gives Joshua his commission in John chapter 1, very famous passage, here's a portion of it. Joshua chapter 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, that's from south to north, and from the great river, that's east, the Euphrates to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. 
Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Did you get that theme? He says it three times. Be strong and courageous. This is a time when Israel is going to need to be strong and courageous as they enter the land, as they conquer it and establish the place that God has promised to give them. So Joshua and the Israelites crossed the Jordan River into the promised land, this time not from the south, but from the east. And just as the seas of the, dry, uh, the Red Sea opened up, so the River Jordan dries up and they walk through on dry land. And they begin the conquest of Canaan. Now this section of scripture is one of the most difficult sections to read and understand because of what we call the ethical questions the Canaanite genocide. You see, when God commands Israel to enter the land and tells them to conquer these people who live in the land, he basically says, wipe them all out. Wipe everything out, every living creature. Even the animals wipe them out. The children wipe them out. It's really an incredibly difficult section. Here's, here's one example of that. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 20. It says, when you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women and children, the livestock and everything else in it, you may take these as plunder for yourselves." But then he goes on. However, in the cities of the nations the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance that is in the land itself, do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. The Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hittites, and Jebusites, as the Lord God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshiping their gods, and you will sin against the Lord your God. You see the challenge here. Basically, God says, wipe everything out, every one out. And it seems to include even the children, the innocent children. And so scholars and Christians have, have struggled and wrestled with this for centuries. How could God, how could a good God allow, encourage, even command his people to kill innocent people? Let me give you, I don't have the absolute answers by any means, but let me give you some suggested or proposed solutions or, or maybe helpful responses to this difficult question. Some have suggested that the punishment is severe because really the crimes of the Canaanites were horrible, far more than we can even imagine. And in fact, th these people were so evil, they deserved annihilation. They say they practiced extreme cruelty, even uh, child sacrifices, killing their own children as sacrifices to the gods bestiality and, and just horrific, horrific sins that these people needed to be wiped out because they would be such a horrible influence on Israel. Another view is, is sort of a very significant qualifier to that, saying the punishment is not actually as severe as it seems. The language is, is hyperbole. It's exaggeration. The destruction was not as bad as it sounds. When God says utterly destroy, he's using the language of the ancient Near East, which means total victory, not annihilation. It's, often, it's also often pointed out that these were not primarily cities with civilian populations that they were attacking, but rather military outposts. So the number of civilians killed would be very small. It's also said the real goal here was not to wipe them out, but to expel them from the land. So they forced them to leave the land. When it says wipe them out, really that means just forcing them to leave rather than murdering or killing all of them. So that's a second possible way to explain this. A third possible way is that the, the punishment is severe, but the results are merciful, particularly for the children. Some have pointed out that innocent children who were too young to have, to have sinned would be saved spiritually because they had not faced or they had not reached the age of accountability. If they had grown up in that cultural context, they would face eternal judgment from God. Instead, God would save them because they were too young to make that decision. Now, you might say, none of those sound very good to me. And as I said, this is one of the most difficult uh, 
and challenging problems in all of Scripture. How do we explain this? Some have suggested this is a, a different God. This is an evil God. This is not the God of the Bible. Or that the Israelites misunderstood what God said and they acted like ancient peoples did in, in this day and age and they missed God's message. That, that's hard to agree with since it says the Bible is actually wrong in this context. Probably the best thing we can say, and this is our fourth proposal, is that God's ways are a mystery. We really can't comprehend in our humanity what was happening here. We'll learn that when we finally get to heaven and can, can ex examine these issues with a, with a greater understanding of God's ways and purposes. All right, we can't go through the whole conquest of Canaan, but let's just talk about a few events in the conquest of Canaan. Uh, two, two cities in particular, the city of Jericho, probably the most famous city conquered, and the city of Ai. And the theme here is the consequences of obedience and disobedience. I'm sure you've heard the story of Jericho. God commands Israel to march around the walls of Jericho once for six days, carrying the Ark of the Covenant with the priests walking around. And then on the seventh day, they're supposed to walk around the city seven times. And after the seventh time, they're to shout and blow their shofars, blow their horns, and the walls of the city would crumble. And sure enough, the walls of Jericho tumble down, and Israel has a great victory and establishes themselves in the land. But there's one glitch. God had commanded them to take none of the things from the city as plunder, to give it all to the Lord, to devote it to the Lord. But one man named Achan took some of that plunder, took some of those riches, and buried it in his tent. Israel then moves on to the next city, a city called Ai. It's a smaller city. And so they decide that they don't need to take the whole army. They just send a few thousand men to attack the city of Ai. And that army gets defeated, humiliated. And Joshua goes to God and says, what happened here? And, and first of all, they never consulted God. They never asked him. But then God says, you've sinned. One of your people has sinned against me. And so Achan is judged. Achan is chosen by Lot from among the Israelites. And he's judged for his sin. So the theme here is, is God's faithfulness. When we respond positively to his covenant promises, when we obey him, he is faithful. When we disobey him, we suffer the consequences. All right, so the conquest of Canaan. Joshua and the Israelites conquer Canaan, establish themselves in the land. What comes next is the division of the land as the land is divided among the 12 tribes of Israel. If you remember, those 12 tribes were the 12 sons of Jacob who was renamed Israel. Um, there's a slight modification, though, because the, the Levites, the descendants of Levi, one of the 12 tribes, don't get an inheritance in the land. Uh, they're given various cities instead because they're the, the, the clergy class. They're the pastors, if you will, and they're scattered throughout the land. Instead, Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, each get their own tribal allotment. So the number is 12, but the number is 12 without Levi and with Joseph divided into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. You can see in this map the division of the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, there's Joseph's, uh, Joseph, there's Joshua's primary, there's Joshua's primary role, which is establishing the land, conquering Canaan and establishing Israel in the land. As Joshua is growing old and about to die, he gives a farewell to the people. And it's one of the most famous farewell discourses in the whole Bible. Um, a very famous, famous speech that he gives. And here's one little section from it. Here's Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Joshua says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, before this, rehearses the whole history of Israel from the time of Abraham all the way down to the present. Then he says, God is faithful to his covenant promises. He's given us the land. Now you need to be faithful to him. Serve him faithfully. My household is going to do that. Yours should as well. Unfortunately, Israel doesn't follow through on that, that command. And what follows the death of Joshua is a very dark period for Israel's history. 
We call it the period of the judges. And it's, it's marked by cycles of failure and restoration. And this is the way it goes. This cycle occurs again and again and again throughout the entire book of Judges. First of all, the people forsake God and turn to idols. We learn in, in Judges that they, the generation after Joshua forgot all about Joshua. They forgot the victories of the Lord and they turned to idols. So God judges them by allowing foreign invaders to come and to oppress them. And when the people are, are severely oppressed, um, they call out to God. They, they repent and cry out to God. They repent and God sends judges. And these judges are like kings and they come and they lead the people into victory against the oppressors and once again establish independence in the land. But then sadly, the cycle begins again as the next generation forgets about the Lord and they turn to idols. And so God sends another oppressor at that time who judges the people. And the people repent and cry out. And you get this vicious cycle. Here's the cycle being described in, in Judges chapter 2, verses 10 through 19. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served Baals. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. They were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods and serving and worshiping them. That should actually be Judges, not Joshua, that particular reference there. There's a key theme that's repeated, a slogan that's repeated throughout Judges. And here it is. It says, in those days, Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. Or in the King James Version, everyone did right in their own eyes. You can see this is repeated again and again. And it really has a double meaning. Because when it says Israel had no king, in one sense, that means a physical king. They had no physical king to, to maintain law and order. And so everyone's doing whatever they want. But there's a double meaning there because it also refers to God as the true king of Israel. And people were not serving God as their king. So they did whatever they wanted. A, a terrible period of dismal failure. And we can't go through all the judges. There's a dozen or so judges. Let me just briefly summarize three of the most prominent judges and talk about sort of the themes related to their lives. The first judge uh, or the first judge we'll look at is Deborah, amazing, um, a, a woman actually, the, the one woman judge that appears um, in the book. Um, in each case, these judges in some sense or another are unlikely heroes. And Deborah is an unlikely hero because she's a woman. Um, actually, in, in, the, in this story, there's two women who become unlikely heroes. Deborah and uh, Jael. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute here. The enemy, the oppressor, is the Canaanite king Jabin and his general Cicero. Now you can see I've given you a map. J Jabin was king of Hazor, which is in the far north of Israel. He went to battle, went to war um, against the Israelites, oppressed the Israelites. Um, his general Sisera um, led the forces. Deborah goes to Barak. Barak was the... the her leading general, and says, you need to go to war against Jabin, against Sisera. Barak says, I'll only go to war if you'll go with me. Uh, and Deborah responds and says, if, if I go with you, a woman will be the victor. She'll be acclaimed the victor, not you, Barak. And, and that's what happens ultimately. But Deborah is not referring to herself. She's referring to a woman named Jael. What happens is Sisera, the general of, of the Canaanite army, gets routed, gets defeated, and he's fleeing, and he, he comes to a tent. He comes and sees a woman there, and he, he says, hide me, and the woman beckons him in and lets him hide in her tent, and he goes to sleep in that tent, and that's Jael, and she takes a, a, a spike from the tent, a tent, tent peg, and he dro she drives it into his forehead and kills him in his sleep. Gruesome scene uh, there. Um, so the victory is achieved by Deborah, who leads the forces, and then by Jael, who kills the, the, the general of the Canaanite forces. So there's the first judge of prominence, Deborah. The second prominent judge is named Gideon. 
And again, here is an unlikely hero. You might remember the story of Gideon. Uh, Gideon is an insecure person and he doesn't know whether he's truly hearing from God. So when God commands him to, to go against the Midianites, he says, do you really want me to do this? He says, prove, prove that you're truly God. And he lays out a fleece. He lays out a fleece and he says, if you're truly God, um, keep this fleece, make this fleece wet and the ground around it dry. And then he reverses it and does the same thing. Make the fleece dry and the ground around it wet. And, and God does this two times to show that he is truly commanding and ordering Gideon. Uh, in his insecurity, Gideon can't trust God, but God uses him anyway. And just to prove that the victory is the Lord's, uh, God wheedles down. He, he limits Gideon's army. Gideon starts, I think, with 30,000 troops, and God brings that down to 10,000. Finally, God brings it down to 300 men, 300 soldiers, and Gideon goes against the Midianite armies. The enemy here are the Midianites. The Midianites were roving bands of raiders. You can see they're located down there near the, near the Red Sea on the Sinai Peninsula. That's where they were from anyway, but they would roam around um, invading. The theme here is God's strength in our weakness. Gideon doesn't have enough soldiers to possibly defeat the Midianites with only 300 men. But in God's strength, it is God who accomplishes the victory. The third most prominent judge here is Samson. Another, once again, an unlikely hero. Samson was an incredibly arrogant man. From, from birth, God said, Samson's going to be an amazing person. He's going to be a Nazarite. He's going to have this vow to the Lord from, from birth. He's never to cut his hair. And God is going to make him the strongest possible man. And, and over and over again, Samson defeats the Philistines. The enemy here is the Philistines on the, the coastal peoples who are oppressing Israel at the time. And over and over again, in his incredible strength, single-handedly, um, Samson defeats the Philistines. Um, but Samson, as an arrogant man, eventually takes a wife from the Philistines. Um, and um, she ends up deceiving him. Um, no one knows the secret of his strength. Her name is Delilah. And Delilah um, convinces um, Samson that she needs to know that he, he shouldn't hide his source of strength from her. And so he reveals it to her. So she, when he's sleeping, he cuts, she cuts his hair. The Philistines rush in and seize him and take him, um, chain him up and take him to their temple. The theme of Samson is finishing well because the Philistines are having a huge party in their temple and they bring Samson out to make fun of him, to mock him. They chain him to two pillars. And Samson prays that God would return his great strength and God does and he pulls the pillars down, collapses this entire temple of the Philistines. Um, the last thing said about Samson is that he killed more Philistines in his death than in his life. So again, a tragic hero, a deeply flawed individual, but one whom God uses to accomplish his purposes. So once again, the period of judges, a, a dismal period in Israel's history, a period of failure in many cases where over and over again, Israel rejects God, turns to evil, turns to idolatry. God always responds when they repent. He always responds with deliverance and salvation. All right, we saw Joshua and Judges. There's one other book I want to cover, and that's the little book of Ruth. Ruth is a story. It's a narrative about a woman named Ruth, and it's actually set in the period of the Judges. And the whole story of Ruth stands in contrast to what was happening in the Judges. It's a ray of light in the midst of darkness. So let me tell you the story of Ruth. It starts with a woman named Naomi. Um, Naomi and her, her family are living in Israel. They're living in Bethlehem, but then a famine breaks out in the land. And this famine is so severe, they're starving to death. So they need to leave. So they become refugees, basically. They leave Israel and they go to the land of Moab. Uh, Moab's, the, the Moabites were descendants of Lot. So they were related to the Israelites. Um, but while in Moab, her, their tragedy turns even worse when um, Naomi's husband Elimelech dies. And then um, his, her, her two sons marry Moabite women, um, Ruth and Orpah. But um, then both sons die as well. So tragedy upon tragedy. She, first of all, has to leave her land and, and leave as a refugee. 
Then her husband dies, and now her two sons die. Uh, she then hears that the famine has let up, and so she wants to return to her family who can help and take care of her. So she returns, um, and she tells her two daughters-in-law to stay in Moab, to go back and stay in Moab with their own people. Um, Orpah does that, but, but Ruth chooses to stay. She demonstrates her loyalty, her love to Naomi by choosing to stay. Here's the famous statement by Ruth. Uh, Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. So here a foreigner, a Moabite woman, chooses to stay with Naomi, her mother-in-law, and to care for her and support her and encourage her. So we see an act of love and loyalty in the midst of the period of Judges when there was so much hate and so much disloyalty. We see that theme continue um, in a man named Boaz. Boaz is a wealthy man who owns a plot of land. And Ruth goes to glean in his field. Glean means picking up what's left over after the harvesters go through. And uh, Boaz sees her and and has compassion on her and encourages her and supports her. To make a long story short, eventually they they marry. Um, And um, Boaz takes um, Ruth to be his, his wife. And an amazing story of kindness and compassion demonstrated to a foreigner, demonstrated to a Moabite. But that's not the end of the story because at the very end of Ruth, We see God's greater purposes in all of this. Um, After the marriage, here it says, So Boaz, this is Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 and following. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. That phrase, guardian redeemer, is, is Boaz, who's restored her inheritance. May he become famous throughout Israel. And then it gives a little genealogy from Boaz forward. Boaz was the father of Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. King David, the greatest king in all Israel, is a descendant of Ruth. So in the midst of all this horror, in the midst of all these terrible things, you you see this, this one light shining in the story of Ruth. You see kindness. You see Loyalty, you see love, even demonstrated for the outsiders. So much a picture of what God has done for us. When we were outsiders, when we were enemies of his, when he, we rejected him, he continued to love us and bring us back into a right relationship with him. It also reminds us that no matter how difficult circumstances can be, God works through difficult circumstances. God works through flawed people whether it's COVID or a loss of a job or health problems, whether it's relationship struggles that you're you're going through right now, God can take those difficult circumstances and turn them into good. When we trust him, when we stay faithful to his covenant commandments, when we were weak, when we were unable to respond, uh, he reached out and loved us by sending his son to suffer and die for us. As the Apostle Paul says it so beautifully in 2 Corinthians, when we are weak, that's when we're strong. That's when God steps in. We trust in him. If you're struggling, whatever you're struggling with this week, just remember that message. That if if you're struggling, that's when you should turn to God in faith, in dependence. He will lift you up and encourage you. And then give you opportunities to be a blessing for others. Let's close our time together with with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for for these lessons, positive lessons that you are faithful to your covenant, negative lessons as as people reject you and turn away from you and and, and worship other gods. Lord, help us to to heed these lessons, to recognize that faithfulness to you brings blessings, that you are a God of love, you're a God of loyalty, you're a God of grace who pours out his blessings on us. Lord, this week, as whatever we're facing, whatever challenges we go through, I pray we would trust in you You would lift us up and enable us to to shine the light of your salvation on those who've never heard it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Don't forget on Tuesday nights that we have a Q&A time together, a good book Q&A time on this passage or other questions you might have. Lots of good issues here. You can bring your questions on Tuesday night. That's at 7.30. If you don't have the link, uh, email Pastor Ken. He'll send you that link. We'd love to have you join us. Thank you.